Our uh, forum is resuming its session now, this time around through workshops which will be focusing on Palestine in opinion polls. In this session, we have two interventions, the first by Dr. The first intervention by Dr. Shibli Telhami and the second by Dr. Muhammad Al Masri. I will give a brief introduction of Dr. Shibli Al Telhami. His intervention will be shifting American public attitudes on Israel Palestine and their impact on politics and policy, Dr. Talhami doesn't need any introductions. I'll just pick some aspects of his bio and uh, he is a researcher and a university professor and also is, uh, uh, he teaches at Maryland University. He has two books will be published. The first on the reality of the one state from Cornell University. The second will be on the peace process and in the age of Trump and Biden. These are, these books will be published soon in English. The second intervention by Dr. Muhammad al-Masri entitled Palestine in Arab Public Opinion. Dr. Muhammad Masri is a researcher at the Arab Center for uh, Research and Policy Studies, and he is in charge of the Arab uh, Public Opinion Indicators, and he will be talking about Palestine in Arab public opinions. Now I give the floor to Professor Shibli in 15 minutes, please. Good afternoon to you all and thank you to the Arab Center and the Institute for Palestine Studies for hosting this forum, which comes at a very critical uh, phase, not because of what's happening on the ground, but uh, because of the current trends in the Arab world and internationally. In this brief intervention, I'll allude to the changes and shifts in the American public opinion on Palestine and Israel, I'll be speaking. I'll be speaking in English, and the current uh, issues in the United States. I will start by some conclusions. Regarding the opinion polls I, I conduct through our center, and I've been doing that for decades now, maybe 30 years ago or so since we started, and there are some conclusions based on the changes and shifts in the American public opinion, and I will uh, briefly introduce some of the conclusions and the dimensions and impact on American policy vis-a-vis -vis Israel and Palestine. Let me start. The most important uh, between the Republicans and the Democrats, you know, about the polarization in general, but regarding this issue, there wasn't so much of a divide. It was uh, 
there was agreement on the Republicans and the Democrats, but in the last 10 years, there was a major shift in the division between the Democrats and the Republicans. I'll give you an example. Okay, I'll continue. I'll continue in Arabic then. So far as the first division, in the last opinion poll we held, which was not related to the Middle East, it was on the Ukrainian issue, I posed an open question, which is the country considered to be the most important ally of the United States? The Republicans and the Democrats say Britain. This is something common between the two. But after Britain, the, the Republicans say Israel. So now we have the NATO alliance in the Ukraine, yet the Republicans say Israel as an ally is more important than France, Germany, Canada, and other members of the NATO. But when you ask the Democrats, they do not mention Israel as the important ally or the main ally, less than less than uh, zero point five percent say that Israel is the most important ally of the United States after countries like Mexico and uh, South Korea. So Israel does not come to it. In fact, another example is a question I I've been. Posing, do you want the United States to be biased to towards uh, uh, Israel or Palestine? Now we say less than half amongst uh, the Republicans say we want the United States to be uh, on the side of Israel. The other half say. Uh, only 2% of the Republicans say they want uh, the, the United States to be on the side of it. As for the Democrats, the vast majority say that they want the United States uh, not to be aligned with Israel. And the ones, uh, most of the, the majority of those who say they want the United States uh, allied to Palestinians is more than, than the ones who want the United States to be allied with Israel. And amongst the youth age group below 35, I think three to one of them prefer the United States to side with the Palestinians and not the Israelis. Amongst the Democrats, another conclusion is there is a big gap in all opinion polls in the Democratic Party between between the grassroots and public uh, opinions and the political elites. The grassroots of the Dem Democrats criticize Israel a lot more than the party's leadership in the Congress or the White House. And when we ask the supporters of the, the grassroots supporters of the Republican Party, when we ask them about uh, uh, is the leadership of the party more aligned towards Israel than your own position, we see that the vast majority say that of the Repub of the Democrats. They say that uh, there is a gap. They know that their leadership is uh, inclined to ally themselves with Israel more than the grassroots. In all the opinion polls, uh, and amongst the Republican Army, uh, Republican uh, Party, sorry, there is no agreement to the with the idea of. Uh, punishing Israel or applying sanctions, whereas there is a majority amongst the Democratic Party's grassroots who support the idea because of the question of settlements. And so far as the BDS issue is concerned, 
the vast majority of the American public does not know anything about BDS. The ones who do, the Republicans are against it, and the, the percentage of those amongst Democrats who support BDS is much higher. So even with the BDS, with the involvement of some laws, we ask people directly, do you support or do you object to legislation being issued in the United States who, who so far as the boycott of Israel is concerned? The vast majority of the American public are against the, 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 the against uh, imposing sanctions on those who boycott Israel. Uh, there are uh, two other conclusions. Uh, the two-state solution and the one-state solution. Historically, American public opinion supported the two-state solution because this was uh, this was the idea which was floated politically. And now we see an increase in supporters of the one-state solution with equal rights to two peoples rather than supporting the two-state solution. So the gap is smaller. And in this regard, there is a question that we generally ask, and that is, do you prefer if there was a choice at the end of the day, and the choice was between supporting Israel as, as a Jewish state, but non-democratic state, or the opposite, as is, do you support or prefer Israel as a democratic, but non-Jewish state? I think most Americans would choose a democratic Israel, non-Jewish democratic state. The vast majority of Democrats support this idea, and there is a minority amongst the Republicans who support it. Too. Of course, there is. <coughs> we know that. First of all, let me tell tell you why this difference. There are three important points here. The first point is the internal division in the United States now has become very important. The Republicans and the Democrats, the division between them is very big now and very significant because the Republican army is uh, linked to the Israeli government is more. As you know, Israel in the last few years, there were far-right governments in Israel, and they used to link themselves to, to and uh, used to interfere in the American political scene in favor of the Republican Party. For this reason, this created a gap between Israel and the Republic, the Democratic Party. Also, there are democrat demographic changes occur, especially amongst the youth, which lead to the 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 Democratic Party now. The the grassroots supporters are mostly Hispanics, Latinos blacks and non-whites in general, and they tend to be supportive of the Palestinian cause. This is an important shift. Even amongst the evangelicals, we know in the Republican Party, m most important support for Israel comes from the evangelicals. And uh, until now, their support is probably the strongest uh, as more than the support of American Jews of Israel. I wrote an article about this. There is also an important shift amongst the youth, even amongst the evangelicals, to the point that the percentage who support Palestine in the under 25 year age group amongst evangelicals, the supporter of Palestine is almost equal to those who support Israel. 
The other important aspect is the uh, Israel-Palestine issue is not looked at uh, through the lens of strategy or religion, but as an issue of social justice, especially at a time when the United States is waging an ethical war on the basis on democracy and Black Lives Matter, and there is a linkage between what's happening in the Palestinian territories and Israel through the perspective of social justice and the youth, because they focus on these issues more, sympathize more with the Palestinians. So will all of this change anything so far as American foreign policy is concerned? As we know, currently the Palestinian-Israeli issue is not an important uh, issue in the United States. The internal rift and the war in the Ukraine, and even those who support the Palestinians or the Israelis do not focus uh, specifically on this issue when they take any political positions, whether the level of the Congress or the presidency. And, of course, this will impact public opinion, undoubtedly. But I say that the importance we see now is in the Democratic Party at the level of the primaries when candidates are selected for, uh, pub for public office. Uh, ultimately, in the elections, the main issue is the division between Democrats and Republicans. So uh, Republican voters would not vote for a Democrat and vice versa no matter what and no matter what their position is vis-a-vis -vis the is Palestinian Israeli issue secondly republicans by and large even if there there is a democratic candidate who sympathizes with the israelis more than the palestinians and his position is against the position of the public opinion, he will be supporting Israel less than the Republican candidate. So in the general elections, there will not be much choice between the Republicans or the Democrats. For this reason, the main battlefield in this will be in the primaries. For this reason, many candidates who sympathize with the social justice in Palestine and Israel won the nomination and eventually made it to the Congress. So therefore, please look at what happened in the last elections in the primaries. For the current uh, Congress, we see that APAC spent more than $20 million only on uh, candidates in certain states uh, based on their support of Israel. In Maryland, my state, uh, there was a candidate uh, who APAC spent $6 million on her to beat her because uh, her position was based on social justice and therefore considered a, a, a critic of Israel. Of course, the money they spent uh, bore fruit, but ult ultimately this, they, were, they spent a lot of money, yet not in all cases did they achieve success. Spending huge amounts of money have impacted the elections to a certain extent, but not as it was thought. I think in the future, the game will focus on these primaries more than anything else. Thank you. Now, Dr. Mohammed al-Masri will uh, talk to us about the Palestine in Arab public opinions.
Good afternoon. Thank you to the Arab Center and the Institute for Palestine Studies. I'll talk about the main trends in uh, but let me first say a few words about the Arab indicator which we carry out in the Arab countries and we do it. It used to be on annual basis. Now we do it every two years, once every two years, because it's enough to gauge the directions of public opinion. Very briefly, the Arab indicator is, uh, is, takes into account representative uh, samples so that the results would reflect the trends in the public opinion in each country where the survey is conducted. In 2022, about a month ago, we uh, launched, launched the eighth round of the results, and this the Arab indicator is the largest public opinion survey conducted in the Arab world through the number of respondents and the number of countries and the number of the variables we we check. 470 variables. You see this slide shows the, the size of this survey and 149 surveys. We covered 15 Arab countries, about 7,000 uh, uh, persons conducted and uh, the equivalent of, uh, of more than 160 years of work, total hours of work. We covered over 6 million kilometers to reach uh, the households. We visited 389,000 households in the Arab region. These are the numbers of respondents. And the last one in 2022 was 33,300. Why do we do this? We believe that the, the Arab country uh, requires that the the public publication of uh, the results will allow the researchers and all those who have an interest as well as the general public of course this is about uh, the uh, the survey itself now uh, and uh, <coughs> Contrary to what Dr. Shibley has said about the United States and the, in the Arab opinion vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian issue in the Arab world, there is no such division. We ask uh, the people first, do you consider the Palestinian issue as the issue of exclusively Palestinian people or all the Arab people and the chart shows that the, the, from 2014 until now almost, there is almost unanimity that there, this is the issue for all Arabs. There are slight changes year to year, but there is almost unanimity that these results are not impacted by the political economic or social change which impact the public opinion. Secondly, even after the normalization efforts which we have seen lately and all the promotion that they got, we see that still the Arab public opinion sees that the Palestinian issue is still the issue of all Arabs 
This means that <coughs> there is an established view amongst Arabs in almost every region which makes people see the Palestinian issue as his own or his uh, partner in it, which he should not leave to the Palestinians only. When we analyze these trends according uh, from different regions, we find that the majority are uh, agree on agreement that the Palestinian issue is a issue for all Arabs and not just Palestinians. So this is a well-established fact in all Arab countries. When we try to analyze according to the basic changes, basic uh, variables, we will find that there is not much difference between the different age groups or the levels of education or the economic or social situation or between males and females. What is noticed in this question uh, regarding uh, the respondents who said the Palestinian cause is a cause for all Arabs, we find out uh, that uh, the supporters of democracy in the Arab world are mo in more agreement and unanimity that the Palestinian cause is the cause of all Arabs. And this indicates that people who believe or aspire to democracy find themselves partners in the, in the Palestinian cause more than the opponents of the democratic process. The second indicator is the trends among the citizens in the Arab world towards recognizing Israel. And from 2011 until now, we find that there is almost unanimity on the citizens of the Arab region uh, who are against their country's willingness to recognize Israel. And this semi-unanimity which is uh, present at the Arab level. It's Arab. It's present even in the countries where their governments had uh, concluded peace treaties with Israel, like Egypt and Jordan, and the Palestinian Authority. And this rejection is there and is the subject of agreement amongst Moroccans, Mauritanians, and all the countries where the survey was conducted. Once again, we see that there is a, an established cultural value up, uh, upheld by Arab people year after year. to reject recognition of Israel. When we analyze this result, as the slide shows, according to the variables, we find that there is not uh, a specific uh, section of society which uh, supports uh, recognition b from one group to another. For statistical reasons, from the point of view of uh, gender or economic or social uh, situation of the respondents, the family differ. There is no division according to these levels, the levels of the dem demographic and other types of analysis. We asked those who reject recognition of Israel about the reasons why. What is noticeable here is the absence of, of cultural or religious reasons for rejecting recognition of Israel. The vast majority 
of those who reject recognition of Israel focus on issues relating to colonialism, settlement, and the Israeli occupation, and the fact that Israel is an expansionist country seeking hegemony, or because they think the Israeli state deals uh, uh, in a way which amounts to racial discrimination against Arab people and the Arab countries. The citizens of the Arab countries are, are using the kind of vocabulary which are present in the national liberation movement's discourse and, and not as a religious or cultural or civilizational struggle as some may like to uh, depict this uh, struggle to be. Those who support recognition of Israel, despite the small size of uh, this section and when they give their reasons why they reject this recognition, you will find that about half of them is basing their position on the fact that maybe if the recognition of Israel can lead to the establishment of a Palestinian state or a just peace. And the just peace in the eyes of the citizens of this part of the world is to end colonialism. Of, and uh, and uh, they, they really uh, wondered why we should even ask for the reasons why, because they thought the reasons were self-evident. So therefore, why do they accept or reject the recognition was through the open question formula. We did not give them any multiple choice questions. So each respondent used his or her own words to describe the reasons why. And so therefore, there is no cultural basis for this refusal or rejection. <laughs> the, the, the other indicator, and that is which countries pose the biggest threat or security threat to the Arab countries, the, uh, either the majority or the largest bloc all agreed that Israel is the biggest, the source of the biggest threat. And this is consistent with the reasons that they had given for the question of rejecting Israel, a recognition of Israel because Israel seeks hegemony. In a nutshell, if we add the Israel and the United States together, we'll find that the vast majority of the citizens of the Arab world uh, see that uh, Israel and the United States are the biggest threat to the security of the Arab world. When we analyzed uh, the trends that showed that uh, Israel constitutes the highest level of threat, uh, we realized that there isn't a difference uh, from a statistical perspective uh, between the responders, uh, uh, irrespective of their educational uh, level or age group, uh, or their own description of uh, uh, the economic and social status of their families. Uh, so uh, females uh, were much more confirming than uh, male. They confirmed more that Israel constitutes the highest threat when it comes to national uh, 
security and those who are in favor of the democratic system uh, resulted or uh, resulted to the conclusion that uh, uh, Israel constitutes a threat to national security. So the assessment of American policy vis-a-vis Palestine. So we tend to analyze the policies of some international regional powers vis-a-vis Palestine. Throughout the years, uh, since 2016, we started posing this particular question. And since then, we have found out that there is a consensus amongst the citizens of the region and uh, they uh, looked at the policies of the United States uh, towards uh, Palestine. So these policies have been described as being negative. 77% uh, uh, was the highest percentage when Trump was uh, voted for. And what does that mean? If the United States of America continue with its policies uh, towards uh, Palestine, so we are going to continue seeing a negative position and opinion from this part of the world towards American policies. And as you can see, the opinion polls, there are no positions against the Americans. There is no anti-Americanisms or anti-America. There is no stance that is against the Americans as a people or as America, but there is a policy or a position against the foreign policy of the United States of America. So once again, we have the different assessments here. So uh, people in need, their assessment is much more negative when they look at the American policies towards uh, Palestine. So when it comes to the Russian policies, uh, most people in the region consider Russian policies as not good towards the Palestinian cause. And uh, this policy was constantly assessed as such. So the same thing applies uh, to the assessment of the Russian policies vis-a-vis -vis Palestine based on the basic variables. And we have to note here that females in the region, women in the region, they consider the policy to be much more negative compared to uh, men in the region. So the assessment of the French policies vis-a-vis -vis Palestine, also it is assessed as being not positive, as being negative towards Palestine. So citizens of the Arab region think that international powers and regional powers, their policies are negative towards the Palestinian cause which means that Arab citizens are not pleased, are not happy with these policies. And this is due to the fact that the Palestinian cause is their cause as Arab citizens. And if we would like to see a change in the public opinion of the regional and international powers, so there should be a change in the policies of those countries when it comes to how they look at the Palestinian cause. So this is the last slide, which look at the assessment of Turkish policies vis-a-vis -vis Palestine. And the situation is different. There is a different, there is a division when it comes to the Arab citizens vis-a-vis -vis the policies of Turkey. And there are some changes throughout the years. 42% of Arab citizens think that the policies are negative as opposed to the rest who think that the policies are positive. So 58% of the population uh, in 2018 thought that the policies were good, as opposed to 34% who thought that the policies of Turkey were negative. So there is a change in the way the Turkish policies are seen by the Arab citizens. So the last question, this is also a question. This is pertaining to the view as to how citizens look at Israel, see Israel. So do you think that the current policies by a number of international powers 
constitute a threat to the region and the stability of the region. So there is a kind of a consensus when it comes to the public opinion of the Arab world. And here we're talking about 84%. 84% of Arab citizens think that the policies of Ezra Israel in the Middle East, uh, these policies constitute a threat uh, to the security and stability of the Middle East. And 74% of the population think that uh, the policies of Israel constitute a threat, are a source of threat when it comes to security and stability of the region. Once again, there aren't uh, huge differences from a statistical perspective between those who consider that Israel threatens the safety and stability of the Middle East. And we have here an observation. Those who are in favor of the democratic system are the ones who confirmed that Israel constitutes a threat to the security and stability of the Middle East. And uh, the uh, groups that are highly educated are the ones that consider that Israel constitutes the highest threat when it comes to the stability and security of the region. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohammed, uh, for this dissection, if we may call it so, of the different uh, Arab opinion trends uh, when it comes to the Palestinian cause. And now I would like to open the floor for a discussion. We kindly ask you to be brief uh, in order to give uh, as many people as possible the opportunity to pose questions and comments uh, on the presentations that have been made by the two guests so far. So the floor is yours. Microphone, please. I have a question to Dr. Mohammed Al Masri. So, how do you see disagreements, contradictions in the different answers when it comes to Iran? There are many responders who did not see a threat from Iran to the Arab region. They did not see a huge threat to the Arab region. But in another question, some considered the policies of Iran as being negative vis-a-vis -vis Palestine. So it is said that Iran uh, interferes in the affairs of Arab countries. Uh, and uh, uh, this is what is said by the Israelis when they describe Iran. So the opinion poll says uh, that uh, their policies are negative, but still they do not constitute a threat. If you can give us further details about that, please. Good afternoon. I have a question to Dr. Al Masri about the public opinion vis a vis the Jews and Judaism. So when Arabs are asked about their view about Palestine, so did you take into account the geographical area? So have you specified and indicated the geographical area? So do you look at Jews in isolation of the policies of Israel because it has become very different, uh, difficult to differentiate between Judaism and Israel in the making of uh, contemporary Judaism. So I am from Palestine, from Haifa. I study in Tel Aviv University. I do not think that nowadays uh, There is another agency that carrying out the making of this. Uh, so this is a problematic that I would like to know. Mm. 
my salutations to you all. I would like to thank you for the lectures. My question is to Dr. Shalabi. When you talked about uh, the differences in the different statistics uh, and the support for Israel amongst Democrats and amongst Republicans, uh, do you have statistics uh, of decision makers, the different uh, decision making institutions? Do you have any statistics? Does this difference uh, also manifest in those institutions or there are different kinds of statistics? Good evening, Dr. Shibli. My question about uh, the transformations when it comes uh, to the public opinion in the U.S. vis-à-vis -vis the Palestinian cause. Uh, we have seen that the same transformations to some extent uh, happen to be in the United Kingdom. But uh, when we try to dis explain these transformations in the U.K., we realize that the most important reasons uh, that uh, uh, account for such change or transformation. This is related to two main matters. The first one is the temporal distance uh, amongst generations, particularly what uh, the Jews had been subjected to in Europe, and particularly when we talk about the Holocaust. So the different American and British generations uh, are, uh, from a time perspective, they are uh, far away from uh, this account, from this story. Uh, so. British people, American people, they look at what is happening now and they concentrate on what is happening now more than they do when it comes to, used to what used to happen or what happened historically. So there is another uh, component that I would like to talk about is modern technology, social media, and the different social media platforms that have liberated the, the recipients in the United States of America from the upper hand of mainstream media that uh, uh, adopts, uh, that used to adopt the Zionist discourse. So we have now a new media that has liberated different uh, uh, media recipients. So I do not know this explanation can apply to what I talked about when it comes to the American public opinion. Thank you. May the peace of God be upon you all. I have a, a question to Dr. Shibli. Do you have any statistics before the presidency of Trump and before the presidency of Obama about the same statistics that you talked about? So do you have statistics uh, of Democrats and Republicans and their view about uh, the Palestinian cause before uh, Obama became president and before Trump became president? May the peace and blessings of God be upon you all. My question to Dr. Shibli. Ahmed Matar has a poem whereby he talked about uh, the Palestinian cause. So Ahmed Matar said that America uses its dog, it uh, uses fire, so uh, the dog does not die, but we become martyrs. So we'd like to give the floor now to the two speakers in order to try to answer the questions and respond to the comments that have been presented. So, Doctor, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. First of all, when it comes uh, to the question about members of Congress uh, and politicians in the United States of America, has there been a change as it is the case when it comes to the popular case? My answer is yes. 
So any member of Congress or politician at the end of the day, that member would think about elections. So when they think about that, so this is not based on the understanding of the different uh, causes on the ground. I have good relations with many members of co uh, Congress and members of the Biden administration. Many of those use to understand the position and they wish that the uh, American policy would have been much balanced. But these are political calculations at the end of the day. But despite all that, then let me tell you, there is a clear change. First, if we look at the criticism even towards the Biden administration, so here we are concentrating on the division between Republicans and Democrats, and we have a Democratic president. And despite that, there was a clear criticism from some Congress members to Biden when he did not criticize the behavior of Israel in the uh, when it comes to the war on Gaza last year. So the level of criticism was very high. And these people are Democrats. And when it comes uh, to the killing of Shirin Abu Akla, the Palestinian American journalist, uh, so we know that there is there was a lot of criticism to the Biden administration uh, from the Democrats. Uh, so even when the Biden administration said that the dossier was closed, the Democrats in Congress did not accept that. And they tried to criticize him and they tried to reopen the dossier. So what have we learned from the Trump administration? We learned from the Trump administration. If there is a president that wants to concentrate on this cause, on this issue, even if it doesn't have a strategic importance, he can be successful in all circumstances. So Trump was able to undertake unprecedented steps as a president. So he took decisions, whether the decisions are right or wrong, but he took decisions. So had Bernie Sanders been elected as president, the policies of the United States of America vis-a-vis -vis this dossier would have been different. So there is a difference between the position of Biden and the position of Bernie Sanders. So the president would have an impact irrespective of the uh, inner restrictions. So we have to take into account the strategic view of the president. This is very important. I know the president since he was a senator. So he thinks that this dossier is not strategically important for the time being and he does not want to pay a political price for the time being and there is another uh, reason he supports uh, uh, israel more than the, the remaining democrats and congress and uh, democrats in congress uh, so there was a question about the uk public opinion and us public opinion the impact of social media and so on. So I would like to talk also about changes when it comes to media. I wrote a number of research papers about the impact of internet and social media on opinions in general, not only when it comes to the uh, Palestinian-Israeli conflicts. Undoubtedly, there is a clear impact. So when we talk about the democracy of media and what has manifested through social media, which opened doors for people, particularly when it comes to youth, they were able to uh, use data, information transfer and exchange in an unprecedented way. And this had an impact. If we look at the number of persons that use social media and their positions in this regard, this would show the situation very clearly. I do not know if there is a direct uh, 
comparison between uh, uh, UK and US because I do not follow the UK very closely, but I would like to say that uh, uh, the US has its own particularities. Uh, so the support of the Republicans, uh, 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 the support of the uh, Republicans towards uh, uh, Israel, this support comes mainly from the evangelicals. Uh, uh, the right Christian uh, Americans. And we have seen that very clearly uh, throughout the decades. And also, we have uh, that there isn't. Uh, a link between the Holocaust and uh, the positions by the Republicans. Uh, we find that uh, the Democrats and in the Democratic Party that is uh, uh, very much compassionate to Israel when it comes to the Holocaust, they, uh, they also uh, are interested in uh, human rights and social justice. But I have an observation that I would like to express here. When it comes to opinion polls before the Obama, Obama administration and Trump administration, undoubtedly internal divisions started since the era of Obama and have increased during the Trump administration. But I would like to give you an idea as to how the president impacts opinions. So before President Trump took the decision to transfer the uh, American embassy to Jerusalem, I had carried out an opinion poll. The majority of the American public opinion was against the transfer of the embassy to Jerusalem, but the Repug Republicans were divided. So, and the evangel evangelicals, uh, the ones that supported Trump's uh, Trump, sorry. Only a small minority were for the transfer of the embassy to Jerusalem. So I carried out another opinion uh, poll, and I have seen that uh, the support had uh, increased. So the steps undertaken by the different administrations have an impact. Uh, so even if the uh, public opinion says that they are compassionate towards Israel, but they do not know even where Israel lies uh, exactly, where Hebron is in Israel, where certain regions are in Israel. Uh, So there is a direct link and impact between the decisions undertaken by presidents and the public opinion. I would like to give the floor now to Dr. Mohammed Al-Masri. Can I go back to the slides, please? Perhaps it would be much easier to demonstrate what I want to say through the slides. With regard to the question that you posed, and the threat to the security of the Arab region, so this was the question that was posed. And by the way, this is an open question. So which country? that constitutes the highest threat to the Arab region. So the respondents had only and only one option, which is Israel. Israel comes always in the first position. The United States of America comes in the second position. The third position is Iran, and Iran constitutes 7%. And if we compare Iran, in 2011, only 4% thought that Iran constitutes a threat to the security of the Arab world. But if we go to the last slide, the slide that says, do you think 
that the current policies uh, constitute a threat to the security and stability of the region. So there is a kind of a consensus that Israel and the U.S. constitute a threat to the security and stability of the Arab region. So Israel and the United States of America, there is a kind of a consensus about them. But also we have 59% of Arab opinion poll that think that the policies of Iran constitute a threat to the security of the Arab region. But in 2016, we had a question in the 2016 opinion poll. So the question was as follows. So we used to ask citizens of the Arab region about their assessment of the policies of Iran and Turkey, Russia, the US, their policies towards Syria. We cannot hear the comment from the public. I'm talking now about 2016, 2016. So we asked about their assessments, the assessments of regional and international powers towards Libya and Syria. One of the very interesting matters for us was the public opinion, the Palestinian public opinion in 2016. The majority of Palestinian public opinion thought that the Iranian policies towards Palestine are positive and the same Palestinian public opinion saw the Iranian policies vis-a-vis -vis Syria as not positive. So what I mean here that the public opinion in the Arab region, it is a very clever public opinion and it can assess policies based on the topic that the responders are asked to assess. So the Iranian policies towards Palestine, the majority of the assessments have been negatives, negative. And the, and there is also a division amongst the Palestinian opinion poll because in Gaza, the assessment was much more negative than the remaining territories of Palestine, mainly the West Bank. So with regard to the following question that was posed about Judaism and Israel. So from what I understood from your question, so the question, do you, are you in favor of recognition, not in favor of recognition? What surprised us is that there were no religious reasons uh, that are important from a statistical perspective. So the terms that were used by the citizens of the Arab region are terms, uh, concepts uh, that are related to national liberation movements. Uh, they deal with Israel as a settlement, uh, as an occupying state, uh, as a, a colonial state. And uh, as a result of that, uh, those people do not want their countries to recognize Israel. So some would pose a question, why some concentrate on the Aqsa Mosque? Yes, the Aqsa represents a symbol. We're talking about the holy uh, sites for Christians and Muslims alike. These are national Palestinian symbols that these countries constitute or consider to be very important. Uh, but also, they do not forget the hegemony and the influence of Israel in the region. This is from my own perspective. Microphone, please. We kindly ask the speaker to use the microphone. 
it seems that there is not there isn't an understanding of the religious dimension of Israel yes I understand your idea now I understood your question Now I understood your question. I do not think that the Arab public opinion is aware of these details that exist in Israel and these religious dimensions and important points that you mentioned, talking about kosher and so on, and the investments that are made in this regard. But the Arab public opinion does not see, does not see as, as far as the opinion polls are concerned that they do not see a conflict between Islam and Judaism. I do not think that the Arab public opinion knows and is aware of the details that you know since you're a specialist and a researcher in the field. So what is important? If a person comes and that person wants to promote uh, normalization of relations on religious bases, uh, talking about the argument or the AQSA argument and the sponsorship of Al-Aqsa, this would not change the Arab position which is against normalization of relations because uh, the Arab opinion poll thinks about normalization as something that is linked to the colonial nature of Israel. So these two would not add up. So even if when there are politicians or analysts uh, from the West uh, who think that the Palestinian cause is the cause of Al-Aqsa or having access to Al-Aqsa, this is not true because the Arab public opinion does not talk about that. And this is something that we were able to understand from open questions that were posed. So the Palestinians, the Arab public opinion, could have talked about the mosques and so on. But they talk about colonialism. They talk about stranding Palestinians. They talk about the right to have a Palestinian nation and state. And they talk about Israel as a settlement, as a racist state, a state that is racist against Arabs, as a colonial state. But they do not think that this applies to the Jews, or they do not describe the Jews as such. So I think that the Arab public opinion is very sophisticated, very respectable, and very smart. Thank you very much. I would like to thank you very much for all the questions that have been posed so far. So we have gone beyond the, the time allocated to this session. So uh, we were supposed uh, to start uh, with the following session about uh, Palestinian division and prospects of reconciliation. So I do apologize to those who did not have the opportunity to take the floor. So we're going to take a short break and then we're going to come back again to attend the session that is going to take place here. Thank you.